Good evening. My name is Kathleen Rodolfo. I'm the executive director of the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. This is our last lecture of the year, um, and we're very happy to be welcoming Dr. Adol Kokor here today. Um, just one programming announcement. We have uh, one public event coming in December, December 15th. It's the UN's World Arabic Language Day, and every year we celebrate and commemorate that day. And we'll be talking about Arabic language and cultural identity this year. So please, um, if you're subscribed to our newsletter, uh, you'll get an announcement for that, if, or to our events page, sorry. You'll get an announcement. If you're not, please do sign up for it so you know when these events are. And it's open to the public, as always, and you're all welcome to join us. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Adel Kukor. He is a physician, philanthropist, and entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of AB Corcor Foundation for Mental Health, which is a foundation that focuses on emphasizing the role of physical activities in mental health. Travel photography is his passion. He's been all over the world, and I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit about that in addition to speaking about the Sultanate of Oman tonight. Um, he's been to over 80 countries documenting the pictures of people, landscape, nature, and wildlife. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, I love to talk about photography. I'm a physician who practiced for 37 years between academic and private practice. I also uh, have uh, been an entrepreneur, having founded many companies over the years. But truthfully, the passion that I have is people, nature, and wildlife. Uh, this is the escape that I go to. Uh, I found beauty everywhere. It doesn't have to be a flight, 12 hour flight over to the end of the earth. Beauty is in your backyard. Sometimes it's right under your feet. You just have to look for it. Yesterday I visited the west wing of the White House and uh, when we were coming out there was a bunch of starlings that were uh, flying and they usually murmurate in the end of the day and there were thousands of them murmuring and everybody was like so overtaken by it I have seen this murmuration in probably half a dozen countries around the world including in the United States in my backyard murmuration was uh, when birds actually form flocks and then they move around in the earth uh, in the sky and in, in formations that are absolutely spectacular and beautiful so uh, I've uh, been around the world. Uh, one year I decided that I was going to see as many countries as I can in as much of a time. I took off for about a month from my practice and I told my partners, I'll see you when I get back. I took a backpack and a camera and I hopped on a plane and flew around the earth. Visited 12 countries in 27 days spent two or three days in every country, planned the hotel, planned, uh, planned the, the airplane, uh, but I didn't have to worry about anything. I had my backpack and, and, and my camera, and you know, I you know, had only a little bit of clothes, just washed it everywhere I've gone. But I tell you, this was the most wonderful experience I've ever had. You know, I got to meet people. Uh, every country I went to, I learned a few words, hello, how are you, just so to introduce myself to them. And it's amazing how many times it helped me get away from problems or situations because I just knew the few words that the natives of this country lives. Why Oman? Why did I decide to go to Oman? And this is my story. I was always a passionate reader. From the time I was a little kid, when my mother would call for me to come to lunch, uh, or dinner, I'm under the bed, not playing with my Lego, not playing with anything, but actually reading, and reading a book, and one of my favorite books that I've read when I was a kid, and I probably read them over and over and again, is little adventure books, one of which was Sinbad. Anybody have read Sinbad books? Raise your hand, because because you know, in America, 
it was foreign. When I came here and I you know, had kids here and started pulling out those Sinbad stories, they were like, what is that? What is that? And then, of course, you know, Sinbad has, you know, in Arabic, they're called up Sinbad. In, you know, they call him Sinbad or, Sin, or Sinbad. You know, he was uh, probably one of the most uh, historically uh, uh, important travel figure. We don't think he was real. We think he was mythical. But no, no matter what, he was someone who really was an adventurous traveler. And he really wanted to explore the world and travel. And one of the trips that he took was literally from Oman from Southern Arabia. And he wanted to go to India. And he wanted to trade what? Frankenstein. So thinking back of my childhood, and I was you know, remembering those stories, I've got to go to Oman. And I think it comes down to Frankenstein. Now, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. And being the inquisitive kid that I was, uh, uh, it is very uh, common in our church uh, to use frankincense, and they put them in holders, and then they they um, they shake them. And I often passed away from the smell of it. <laughs> Somebody for some reason it made me sick, and uh, <laughs> right now I sometimes actually put it in my house by my housekeeper. It gets so crazy. I don't like the smell. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at the end of the day, it is, it is a smell that brought back enormous amount of you know, pleasure in my life. And I wanted to know where it came from. And I remember when I was 14, I went to my mother and I said, where does frankincense come from? Where does it see come? These little things, it's like, and she'll say to me, I don't know. It's like, okay, well, I looked it up and lo and behold, it was, it was Oman. And as of today, Oman produces about 50% of the world's frankincense. The other 50% come from six other countries, including, I believe, India, Thailand, and some other Asian countries. But, but Oman is still an important. It is still a very important commodity that Oman uses. Nature and wildlife, I knew that the Omani government have really been probably one of the most, lead, have, have, have had a leading attitude towards making sure that nature is preserved in Oman. I think Oman is one of the only countries in the world that I know that the penalty for killing a bird is more than if you kill a person. Not to go that far, but what I'm trying to say is that the Omanis have very, very strong belief that wildlife ought to be preserved. In fact, there are some invasive species of birds, well, I will show you one picture of them, that the Omani government refused to address because they feel that their birth, their, their creature of God, we're not gonna mess with them. That nature will balance itself. And these are birds that came from Asia and Malaysia and people when they, when they traveled, they brought them with them. And they dominated, they took over some of the native bird community, but it didn't matter to them. Uh, the Arabian horse, I've always been a lover of horse, horses. And, uh, uh, and uh, I've always wanted to know where they come from. And do you all know that the first introduction to the Arabian hearse in the world came through Mirbath port in Yemen. Thousands and thousands of Arabian horses that were shipped around to Europe came through the port of Yemen and also a few, and one other ancient port uh, I would mention to you about. So what I did, and then actually there was a travel magazine article about Oman, about a woman who traveled on her moped and how she felt so safe and comfortable and never was, you know, was harassed, uh, something that is hard to do in the United States um, or any part of the world where I know. And she was just bragging about how wonderful the people are. I said, you know what, I have to go to Oman. I was gonna do it in 2019 and COVID hits and then 20 and then, and then I ended up doing it last year in 2021. And then this is just uh, 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 directly out of Wikipedia. This is where Oman sits in the middle of the world. You can see, it's like in the center of the earth. Um, and uh, 
uh, and then this is the Omani flag and the emblem of the Omani Sultanate. So, Sultanate. Oman is a Sultanate government. This is again directly right off of the Wikipedia. Uh, it, uh, Oman is a, a country of, uh, I believe, roughly about four and a half, five million people, uh, uh, primarily Muslim, and uh, uh, there are a few Hindus, Christians, and others. Uh, the um, the, the, the thing about having, I've traveled to many, many Muslim countries around the world, and I've been to 20 Arab countries out of the 27 out there. I've never felt so relaxed and comfortable being, being someone who's not traditional, who didn't wear the traditional clothes, who spoke the traditional language. I felt very welcome, very comfortable interacting with men, women, and children without having any reservation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, I think this is about the establishment of Oman historically. It's a very, very old country. Uh, judging from a lot of the discoveries that they have in terms of archaeological digs, it goes way back to uh, uh, you know, about 4000 BC. Some of the oldest establishments that have been found over there were found 400 BC. Uh, uh, for, uh, and uh, really going back to uh, the Nabati dynasty and Portuguese, they were quite involved in the 1500s. Um, the important part about uh, what's happened in, in, in that really uh, uh, Oman is one of the very few countries in the Arab world that was really not occupied by another country. You know, there was, they had a very strong and a, and a, a relationship with the, with, the, with the British government, but they really were never occupied by the British government. Uh, they became independent uh, in August of 1970 uh, and were admitted to the United Nations back in, in 1971. Well, I designed this trip because what I really wanted to do is see all of Oman. I didn't just want to see one region, one section. And knowing me, the obsessive compulsive person that I am, I designed a trip that drove my travel agent crazy because uh, I wanted to go here, there, and everywhere. So I wanted to go to the Dorfer region in the south. I wanted to go uh, all the way up to uh, the uh, section of Oman, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, separated between Oman by United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's called uh, uh, um, uh, right, right. And so anyway, I started my trip and I will go with this trip day by day. I, I, I started out in Muscat, and uh, I went down to uh, Salala, uh, and then I went back to Muscat, and then in Salala I did uh, uh, quite a few journeys around. I went all the way close to the Yemeni borders. Um, I went to Mirbath, uh, I went to the deserts. I was within 50 kilometers from the Saudi borders. Uh, this is actually the, the, the longest, the, the, the widest uh, desert in the world. It's right out there. And, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then I came back to Moscow, then I flew from Moscow up to the, uh, this uh, northern uh, section of, uh, what I think it's called uh, the Norway of the Arab world because there's a tremendous amount of fjords out there, beautiful blue water. I sent some pictures to friends of mine and they thought I was in the Caribbean. And I said, no, I am in Yemen. Uh, I'm in Oman. I've always wanted to go to Yemen, but unfortunately, the situation is not good. And then I actually did this uh, amazing tour within the center part of Oman. Wanted to visit some of the deserts down there. I wanted to go to Nizwa, and I definitely wanted to go to Sur, because this is an area that I have a lot of interest in related to the green turtles, which is the largest turtles in the world. So, so my trip was fairly complicated and uh, I covered the entire state. I did that in about 20 days. Uh, and even my, actually my, uh, I have three guides. And one of my guides, and the last day when he dropped me up at the hotel, he said, you are about to kill me. <laughs> because I, because when, we got to, when we got to Oman, when we got to Muscat, after we've done all of this, I said to him, I said, can we do a hike? He said, what do you mean do a hike? We just did. <laughs> so, so we ended up doing a hike around the city of, of Muscat, and you know it was 
and I'll show you some of the pictures. It was one of the most difficult hikes I've ever taken. I don't think he knew how bad it was, and I did not know how bad it was until we got there. We nearly slipped on the rock a few times. Well, when he got to Muscat, you went to, the first thing I did is uh, visited the uh, Sultan Qaboos, uh, his mosque, which is the greatest mosque in Mos It took about 10 years to build. It was recently finished. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is the grandest of the grandest. Uh, this particular photograph that you're looking at, believe it or not, won a National Geographic Award. Uh, so it is, a, it is a photograph that uh, I'm, I'm very happy with. And uh, I guess uh, the other people were happy with it as well. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful mosque, uh, spectacular. I visited also at night. Uh, the lights were just incredible, hallways, mosaic piece, and this. This is the largest chandelier in the world. Uh, and this is actually, I was laying on the floor taking a picture of it from the town, uh, Mahrab. And now on day two, I immediately got on the plane and flew off to, uh, to Salala in the south, uh, in the Dorfur region. Now the first visit I had was the Sultan Qaboos Mosque. Uh, almost in every big city in Oman there is a Sultan Qaboos uh, Mosque. Uh, this was a, really a very interesting mosque uh, dimensionally and architecturally. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and then after visiting the mosque, uh, I took a tour, uh, beautiful photos, to the market. And uh, the, uh, the market's called Al Balal. Uh, I'm sorry, it's called Al Hafa Market, Hafa Souk, and uh, fish brought out of the ocean. Uh, interesting kind of vegetables. I mean, you're going to see a lot of photographs of things. And then, of course, frankincense. This was my first time ever in my life having touched frankincense in the place where it's actually produced. And one thing I did not know is that there's like 100 different kinds of frankincense. It wasn't just one kind of frankincense. And I was sitting down, and there was this little kid sitting next to his mother, and she handed him a small box of frankincense, and he was just like eating them. I was like, well, what are you doing? He said, well, there, there's a lot of nutritional value. And he said, can I have some? Well, you know, I started eating them. And actually, they have a really a soothing effect. They calmed my stomach. So I actually, throughout my whole trip in Oman, I carried these, but not all kind. It has to be really purified and, and, uh, uh, and a special kind. Uh, it costs more, much more than the others. But believe me, it worked, and I still have it at home. And periodically, when I have obsessed stomach, I, I go and I get it. Uh, it's, it's fun stuff. Well, this is something. Can anybody guess what this is? This, this is the intestine of the camel. And it's made into a, a container that they preserve and put water in. So this is like a, this is like a water jug, and and uh, yeah, I I dared to buy one of these and bring it home <laughs> because I wasn't sure what I would do with it, other than display it in my house. But I wasn't going to store water or milk in it. Uh, and then of course you have to go and you know coconuts is a big deal over there. I mean everybody loves coconut and I love green coconut, so I had to try one of them, and bananas. And then, of course, you know, I told you about the fact that there is a good number of Christians. And I actually asked my God, can you take me to a Christian church? And they, she did. This was in Salala. So we went to uh, this Orthodox church and had some conversation with the people. The majority of the people that go to the church were really native uh, Omanis. Uh, they were foreigners. Oman has a lot of foreign workers that come from different parts of the world. Some of them are Christians and they go to that church. But it was really wonderful to see that as well. And then a tremendous amount of tolerance and cohesiveness in between the different uh, cultures and religions there. This was I, my absolutely the first Omani meal. And I have to tell you, my stomach was sh like turning. I'm a vegetarian. I, I eat meat occasionally. 
very occasionally. And, and I, I told my guide, I said, you know, what, he said, what do you want to have lunch? I said, I want to have like a local lunch. He said, well, you're going to regret this. He said, he said, the only thing I have to offer you is camel meat. And I was like, okay, well, let's just go. So this is actually camel meat that's cooked. Uh, these are rock beds, and they basically put the meat on the rock bed, and that's how they cook it. And, and this is the camel meat. It's very dense. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had to try it. But I actually had to be careful because I had to try it in front of my guide, but I have to make sure that he doesn't really realize I really didn't like it. And so I did manage to swallow it, but then I slowly pushed my plate over to his side, and I actually pushed in his plate of rice onto my side. So I ate the rice, he ate the meat. You can see here, I ate the rice, I ate the rice and the vegetables, uh, and, uh, and then he ate the meat. And it was okay. I mean, I, I have to say, I've tried camel meat, so it's, you know. I made it to the hotel, and I stayed at a really fancy hotel. This is a photo I took on the pool uh, when I came down there, and uh, uh, this is a beautiful picture of sunset. Uh, and then this is actually uh, also sunrise the next day. And now we're into day four. I'm out in the morning running. I, you know, I'm a runner. I, I, I don't consider myself having visited the country if I don't run in it. So I always get in my running shoes and I'm out running and a, wild, you know, a bunch of wild dogs chase me. Not chase me, you know, they say, hi, oh. It's like, mm, what are you doing out here? Well, so I went out running. And they basically just sat and watched me. I was right on the beach. They just sat and watched me, and you know, I finally looked into it, and it turned out to be that it, there's a, a lot of issue with wild dogs there, but the government doesn't want to do anything about it. Again, it's because of the fact that they really protect wildlife. They don't want to, you know, they, they figure they're not gonna go out there and kill them or exterminate them or do anything with them. There are even some debates in Oman about whether or not they should be neutered. Uh, so there's pros and cons, and I've had some conversation with there with some people who are really hierarchy in the healthcare business over there who still don't seem to be willing to accept neutering these wild dogs. Well, I had a, just a wonderful run. This is a spectacular sunset, and I have to share with you this little bit of a story. Yeah. When I was a kid, and I read this Sinbad story. I always imagined myself standing on the shores of the Arabian Sea and seeing his ship crossing over to India. And, and believe me, I am not saying this to just bring the emotions part of it, but every time I share this picture or share this story, I always have tears in my eyes because I think about the fact when I was 14, my father had just passed away. And, and I was reading Sinbad's stories and all the travels and associated with it. And I imagined myself standing down there on, on the shores of the Arabian Sea. And there's a ship that's gonna carry and that's taking my dad and then ultimately my dad was gonna come back. So I always linked the Arabian Sea because my dad died in Kuwait. And at the time I really didn't know where Oman Kuwait was, you know, I was a young kid. So when I stood out there, embedded my feet in the, on the sand, looking over at the Arabian Sea and seeing some of the ship in the distance, it brought back enormous memories. And I just couldn't resist but actually started crying. I can't not believe that I am actually in the Arabian Sea. This is something I have wanted to do from the time I was a little kid. And here I am doing it. And it was just a spectacular morning. I got to see so many beautiful birds, fresh air, and uh, so uh, on that day, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, decided to go to an area called Wadi, Wadi Darbat. Uh, Wadi Darbat is a region where uh, uh, water is fresh. And, uh, uh, and of course, elephants, I'm sorry, uh, uh, were elephants. 
camels are really the most important creatures in that part of the world. I love camels. Why do I love camels? I'm a nephrologist. I'm a kidney specialist. And I have never in my life thought that an animal can survive in the desert without water for six months. Now, how long do you think a man can survive without water? No. Actually, four days at the most. Four days. Uh, camels can survive for six months without water. Now, how do they do it? Can anybody know how they do it? Uh, uh, when I s asked that to my kids, my son said they drink soda. <laughs> Uh, so the answer is not that during soda. They actually have water reserve, which is sits in their home, and that's where the fat is stored, and there's some water stored over there. But there's also something else about them, is that they, they, they are capable of maintaining their intravascular volume, the circulating volume, in their blood. And they're able to do that regard, regardless of what the, what, the ex, what, the, what the amount of water that they have coming into them. The type of the red blood cells, our red blood cells are round. Their blood cells are, are like oval in shape. You know, they, they move differently in the vessels. And, uh, and that, that's part of it. So I'll tell you more about camels uh, and, uh, and my love for these animals. But I want to share with you some of these photographs of this water that are coming in from the mountains down into a clear, beautiful, I never thought I would have this type of things in there. This is again in Wadi Darbat. Uh, beautiful, absolutely spectacular hike. You know, like we see deer in our neighborhood when we're driving, they have camels. Uh, and then we made it to Jebel Samham, which is one of the uh, highest mountains in that region. Uh, we did a nice hike out there and um, and that's me pointing out to this spectacular mountains. And this is my guide, uh, who actually throughout the entire guides that we had, he was in his uh, shoes. He did not actually have real shoes. He had uh, sandals, type of sandals. Uh, and at the end of the day, he was envious of my shoes. But at the same time, I was envious of his because he was a lot more able to get, get around with his than I was with, my, with mine. And then we stopped to have a, a nice lunch. Uh, and this is again uh, going through the desert, uh, the, going through the, uh, the, the same uh, valley area. Uh, and then that is a tree that I'm not sure many of you are familiar with called the Baboa tree. The Baboa trees are some of those spectacular trees in the world. They live to 1,000 years. They are mostly seen in Madagascar. They are also seen in Oman. And, uh, and, and this particular year is probably about a thousand years old. And to give you an idea of how big that tree is, it, is that I actually have a photograph here that you can see. This is my guide down there. So just get a perspective of how big that tree is. It takes about, you know, six people uh, with, with their arm open to be able to hug that tree. So remember that, it's called the Baboa trees. They're endangered. There are very few of them around the world. and. Uh, Hey, Mr. Ambassador, how are you? Come on in. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Good to see you. Yes, please. Welcome to the Baboa trees in Wadi Darbat, this, this photograph here. And then uh, this is the uh, uh, Somharm, which is, uh, this is the, a town that was excavated. Uh, it probably goes back to 400 years uh, BC. And uh, it was, it was a, 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 at the time, it was an important port, uh, and uh, the numerous amount of findings were done. One thing that's really interesting about some of the findings that they found in this is that they, I told you about these, uh, these uh, uh, frankincense uh, uh, incense containers. 
they actually found them there back then in their digging. So, so to, to, you know, you think about how Christianity evolved and, and how they actually use it in the Christian church. What they use in the Christian church where they burn the incense in the same type of containers, those containers were there way back then. They unraveled them. Uh, and this is actually the mythical Queen of Sheba uh, 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 residence, supposedly. Yeah. Uh, that is the uh, 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 Sumharam, beautiful, beautiful town that was excavated. It's the UNESCO heritage site. And then we made it to Mirbat. Uh, like I said to you, Mirbat is a very important uh, uh, fish village, sea village. It's also very important historically because I told you about the Arabian horses and about the fact that it was a place where a lot of shipping happened in that part of the world uh, where the Arabian horse was introduced to the Europeans. Nice, quiet fishing village, uh, some old fishing. And then this was actually the old town, uh, which is uh, uh, no longer uh, functional. And, uh, uh, and then that evening, I, I made it to my hotel and uh, uh, saw a bunch of kids uh, playing on the, on the end. I was watching sunset, and uh, a gentleman came by with his Arabian horse. He offered me to ride it. I said, no. <laughs> I have not been on a horse for quite some time, and uh, as much as I love them, I'm always intimidated and scared of them. Uh, and he just gave me the, the victory sign when he was running by me. We had a nice conversation afterward, and I did give a hug uh, to that beautiful Arabian horse. Uh, it's, it's really, for someone like me who have love for horses, to be able to be there and know that that one Arabian horse that I've had for many years came from there at one point, was transported through there way back genetically. It was just an incredibly emotional. In the same way I experienced when I stepped in the sand of the Arabian Sea, thinking about all the people that have went through it for thousands and thousands of years. It was just an incredible experience. And then, of course, without soccer, where do you go without soccer, you know, in Oman? Everywhere you turn around, there's a soccer field and kids playing soccer and, of course, on the beach. Well, I actually told them I wanted to play with them, and I, I jumped in there, and uh, I quickly stopped. Uh, I did not realize how difficult it is to play soccer on the beach. Have you tried to? I, I run on the beach, but I try to avoid the soft sand because it's a lot harder and these guys were playing soccer on the soft set. I mean, it was very, very challenging. And it, I, I played for about five minutes before I said, see you guys, can I take pictures? So I took some pictures of them. This picture actually was submitted to one of the competition I did. And this was, I like this one too. And then of course, sunrise the next day. Every morning was a spectacular sunrise and a spectacular sunset. And then someone was fishing, uh, and then this was sunrise on the, uh, off the pool of the, beach of the hotel that I stayed at. Uh, beautiful sunrise, and a great blue herring decided to swing by and say hello to me. Day five, now we visited the Kora Mountains, and along the way we stopped at the tomb of Job. Uh, Job is a biblical and Islamic prophet, and uh, uh, it was a, a beautiful shrine. Uh, and, uh, and then from then on, we went on to, uh, to, to, to along the coastal area, uh, we went through a, an area called the Mughsel Beach, and uh, that is on our way to Wadi Afool. And to see camels of this magnitude on a beach was breathtaking for me. I mean, I, I didn't think that, you know, you know the, the camels belong to the beach. You know, you know, when you think about camels, you think about, about the desert. You don't think about them being on the beach. And I mean, it was really funny because I sat and watched them for quite some time, and it was amazing how they were just simply plodding their way through the water of the beach, you know, and they stick their head in there and they shake it as if they're like washing their face. Uh, it was a, quite interesting. Uh, uh, 
the baby is following the mama. And then this guy really was very friendly with me. He really, really was going after my camera. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. Uh, I, I will share with you one thing about Camo that I did not know until I actually got there. And I had a conversation with my, with my uh, guide about it. And I said, you know, what is about their lips, you know? And he said, well, the lips are very important because that's how they actually get everything that they want to get from whatever it is that they're trying to extract. So I went and read about it. And, you know, uh, thank God for Wikipedia especially when you're overseas, you know, looking it up on your phone. And it turned out that their lips is really designed to create the most powerful sucking that you can actually do. And then they can do when they put their mouth on anything that they want to ingest, they literally almost cover it, almost like taking a, a gel and you throw a gel around anything and you know how you seal everything and then you suck it all in. Because for them, imagine, for them, whatever it is that they have sourced for food, they have to take all of it. They can't just let anything go because that is how they survival. They're surviving based on that. So camels have incredible lips and that is crucial for their survival. And it's evolved over years of which it allows them to do this. So, so that's why I have a, quite a few photos of actually really just their face and their lips, and I just, I just love that. Well, then we made it to uh, Shot Cliffs, and these are some of the deepest cliffs uh, uh, in Oman, and I'm, I'm actually standing on top, and, and this is a straight shot down. If my mother was next to me, she'd be screaming bloody. She said, Adam, get off that cliff, but I, I, I didn't, and, uh, and here I am standing over there. Uh, uh, beautiful uh, mountains, beautiful cliffs. Uh, these are some of the uh, spectacular sceneries of beach areas. Um, and then coming close to what I actually have been looking for in my whole trip, when you heard the reason why, why I'm on, is, the, is the, uh, the frankincense trees. I finally got to see one, got to touch it, smell it, and I can tell you that it made my day. Uh, and anybody have seen a frankincense tree? Oh, okay, that's, this is what the frankincense comes, look like off the tree. It's almost like the tree is bleeding, excreting this just incredible fragrance compound that are used to create the incense. But while being in Oman, for close to a month, I discovered that there's so many other things that it's used for, oil, you know, medicinal, and I came home with quite a bit of it. In fact, uh, my massage therapist now uses the frankincense oil, which I brought from, and she keeps saying, my God, it smells so good. I said, well, that's what it is. So think of it, maybe when the next time you go to a store or, t you know, t check it out. Frankenstein oil. Now, this is, day six was really the day, uh, this was some fish that I sold the next morning when I went out running on the beach from the guy who fished the day before must have forgot them. Uh, and this was a turtle that got washed off the beach. Unfortunately, she was dead. So uh, the next day was really a, uh, a day that I had planned for a long time. Uh, I've always wanted to camp in the desert. And, uh, and when I was talking to the, my tour guide and I explained to him what I wanted to do, he says, where do you want to go? I said, I don't care, but take me away from civilization and put me somewhere where I can just sleep under the sky. He said, well, you're not going to be able to do that because it's going to be really cold and you're going to freeze. Well, I said, anyway, I said, so we decided we'd go to the empty, what they call the empty quarters. And I think if you remember the map, uh, we don't have the map here, but it's, it's the area which is the closest to the, uh, the closest to the, uh, I showed you the closest to the uh, uh, Saudi borders, you know. So we were exactly about 40 kilometers from the Saudi borders. Uh, and the name of the town was Hishman. So we, we drove there. Unfortunately, we had a flat tire. So uh, 
uh, and the guy, unfortunately, he was, he was not very familiar with, with how to replace him, and I helped him replace his flat tire. But, you know, we had people standing up along the way, said, can, can we help us? And, no, no, it's okay. We got this tourist guy who's helping us put the flat tire. So I was lying under the car <laughs> doing this. Uh, and then uh, we came across a village called uh, Tumrait uh, that had some uh, camels in there, of course. And, and these are some important um, uh, uh, items that we found in the desert. And apparently they are uh, some type of um, uh, rocks that are formed uh, due to uh, uh, rain and thunder. And uh, when you crack them open, they have this salt compound in them. Uh, they are very important geologically. I don't quite understand their phenomena, but I brought them to a friend of mine who is a geologist and he went crazy. Uh, apparently, this is, each one of these is at least 100 years old. Uh, I took permission. I only brought one. I asked the guy, can I take it? Like, oh, yeah, you can take it. You know. Now, not uncommonly let you see a rakakas of a dead camel. You know, camels live a long life, and they're very, very important for the ecosystem down there. And uh, they really don't have a lot of predators. They die of old age when they're out there in the desert. Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, one remnant of one. And uh, uh, this was a sand dune, some of the most spectacular, beautiful sand dunes in the world. I have not been to Namibia, and that Namibia is supposed to be a place where there would be tremendously wonderful sand dunes, but this is actually, to me, the most beautiful sand dunes I've ever seen. Uh, and this is my guide over there, and we were trying to climb up uh, this, uh, this uh, and for anybody who's ever tried to hike in a sand dune, good luck. But this guy was amazing. And I was determined to do it, and I managed to do it, but it wasn't very easy. It was very challenging. And that's, that's actually him sitting all the way at the end and me following him afterwards. Uh, but you can imagine how spectacular this was. And, uh, you know, we're trying to play with some sands, and I want him to do this so I can take some pictures of the sand flying up in the air. And, uh, uh, and this is the tent that we pitched down there. And he really wasn't very familiar with tents. He went ahead and rented the tent, so he didn't know. So he went ahead and set up the tent for me. And I went in there to sleep in that tent, and I wanted to yeah, notice the uh, notice the beautiful uh, dark sky and with the, with the, with all of the stars in the background. So I I, I told him I said you know um, did you so I went in there uh, and the wind started picking up and it started getting really cold and I'm laying in the, I'm laying in my tent and I'm looking up and my tent was moving. I was like, what is going on? And the wind was blowing and suddenly I was like here and the edge of the tent was right there, and suddenly the edge of the tent is right here. It's like, wait a minute, how did that happen? I went outside, I realized he didn't anchor the tent. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I, I had to wake him up, and then we had to go back in there and anchor the tent. Uh, it was not familiar with how to do it, but, but it was a fun experience, and, and then we, 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 we had a great, we had a, we, you know. So the, the next morning I sat and watched him, having his uh, argile, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, this was a, I love this photo. Uh, this was as, as the day progressed, the sand dune, the breakfast that we, he put together for me. Uh, beautiful night, absolutely, take a look at this sky. Isn't it amazing? I've never ever seen a sky like this. You know, I honestly slept probably three hours. I really did not sleep. And I kept, every time I think about going back into my, into my um, tent, I say, you know what, oh, I'm never going to do this. I've got to be outside. So I would go outside and I would cover myself with, with a blanket because it got really chilly and just look out and just absorb it. Of day seven, uh, we are now heading back. Uh, uh, we, uh, toward what they call Dawi, Daw, Dawi uh, Wadi, uh, Dauka, Dauka, and, and now we're going back actually towards uh, toward uh, uh, Salala, uh, and that is uh, more photos that I've taken uh, coming across some ancient villages. Again, this is another UNESCO heritage site. Uh, uh, this is Shishir, which is 
Chisser, which is also a, a United Nations heritage, UNESCO heritage site where frankincense trees are now being, uh, being produced, are being cultivated and grown over there. Back to Muscat, and, uh, and now I'm looking at from the air, looking at the uh, region, and this is the first thing we visited is the Al Alam Palace, which is uh, His Majesty's the Sultan's home. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the, the souk, which is the, uh, the Mutra, Mutra souk. Those of you who, who are from Oman know that's how famous that uh, souk is and how wonderful. We got there actually uh, when the market was closed, uh, and uh, I got to walk around a little bit. Uh, beautiful. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the lights, the, uh, the chandeliers in there. Uh, and uh, this is the, the beach area. Uh, called the uh, Mutra Corniche, Corniche, uh, lovely areas. Uh, this this castle also go back historically to the Portuguese era. Uh, <coughs> now day nine, we're going to Al Kasab. Now, uh, Al Qasab is a region, like I mentioned to you, way up in the north part by the United Emirates. Uh, it's a um, it's a it's a spectacular place uh, where I told you when I planned my trip, I really wanted to go there for the main reason that I wanted to see the fjords. I wanted to see the beautiful water, uh, and uh, and then this picture I took from the air of the uh, Jebel Al Harim. Uh, which is the mountains that uh, are absolutely spectacular. Uh, the, the, I had a nice conversation with the pilot of that plane, you know, assistant pilot of that plane, and you know, he, uh, he was, uh, it turned out that he was uh, 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 someone who's been around the world quite a bit, and we shared some interesting stories. And this was coming into uh, the Kassab airport. And the first thing we visited was a museum, uh, and this is a, uh, the, the castle, uh, and there is a, I always show this picture because notice how short this uh, staircase is, but uh, there's a sign that says you go up there on your own responsibility. I didn't want to, you know, have to be careful going up without hitting your head. And then this is actually a picture of, of, of Kassab as a, as a village, which is a, a port village. Uh, the hotel I stayed in is actually right out here in this area. Um, now, the one thing that's really interesting about uh, Kassab and about the mountain region is that uh, people have lived there for, for thousands of years. And can you imagine the, the harsh climate that they actually can live in? And you can see that uh, this is actually a house that's made within, within this particular rock, within the, the caves and the mountains. And, and these are some old villages that has been there. Uh, but it's now abandoned. And there's one particular village that, uh, uh, that, that I came across where actually someone had lived there up to be the age of 105. Uh, and he basically lived on you know, goat milk and dates. Uh, uh, this was Sultan Qaboos uh, uh, Mosque in, 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 in Kassab. Uh, this is the market. Uh, and then, of course, you have to have a fish when you're down there. Uh, went up to the Jabal Al Harim, or they called the Guardian Mountains, which was an amazing experience. I um, uh, we saw some spectacular sceneries. Uh, I've traveled all over the United States. I've been to every national park. Uh, this was to me was an almost spectacular. This is this is the house that I was telling you about that this gentleman had lived in until he was 105 years old. You know, just to climb up there and climb back down would just be incredible. Uh, of course, we had goats came in, and then of course these goats were pretty friendly because the minute I got out of there, they went right after me, and they I had a banana in my hand, and they grabbed it and ran away with it. <laughs> they knew what they wanted. Uh, this guy was pretty resilient. Uh, these are some fossils that are millions of years old. This was seen on top of the mountains. You know, we're looking at 5,000 meter above sea level. These were on top of there. So this is, goes back to 
you know, way, way, way back, millions of years ago. Um, probably the dinosaur era. And this was right great. I mean, I didn't have to look for them. They were right there in my face. Uh, and they can see how many of them were right out there. Well, I can go on and on. This was just like amazing. There was another, I love Oman. Uh, this was a, uh, someone designed that and I took a quite a few pictures of it. And then pomegranate, I love pomegranate. I don't know how many of you love pomegranate, but in Oman, I, I had so many of them. I, everywhere I go, I'll take some with me. Uh, then, you know, I noticed something about the Omani people. They really are very, um, they're comfortable with photography. They, they weren't very shy about me photographing them. In fact, some of them came to me and said, do you mind taking a picture of me? Part of it is because, you know, I was, had a professional camera with me. I have a National Geographic jacket on me. It was like, you know, they knew this guy is legitimate. He's not, you know. Uh, so I actually take this photograph of this woman who was about to get married. And she ended up using it uh, as, part of, uh, as one of her wedding photos. So I was, I was really happy. She asked me to do that. And I happily was, uh, was willing to do it. Uh, now, uh, now the next day we, we took a Dow boat uh, and then we traveled uh, all throughout this fjord region. And, and like I said, it was just spectacular. Honestly, some of these photos that I've taken, uh, and then of course you, we saw dolphins. These dolphins are inhabited of that region. Uh, uh, the only part, the only, uh, I believe they're called the black dolphins, black fin dolphins. They're the only, they're, they're the only part of the world where you see them. Uh, and they're small villages, you know, out of the middle of nowhere, uh, way up in the northern part of that section that I told you. And, and you have to remember that part is really very close to Iran. And, and during the visit I was there, when I was talking to the gentleman on the Dow, I ran across a guy who spoke really fluent English, and, uh, and he was assisting uh, the gentleman who was, who was, who was, captain, who was the captain of the, of the boat. And he was telling me that there was a lot of uh, things that sometimes happen in some of these villages where people try to you know, bring stuff over to Iran and bring it back, and they try to smuggle stuff across, uh, and then they do it right across these waterways. But, uh, uh, but, I mean, you can't get away so far from civilization as you would in a place like this, you know. Just a lovely little town sitting in the middle of nowhere, you know. Uh, this is a, an area we actually got out and did some hiking, um, and I can resist taking a photo. I mean, look at this water. I mean, this is just incredible. Uh, this is for sure. I mean, if, if it's in the U.S., there will be Holiday Inn and all kind of other stuff around it, you know. Uh, now, went back to Moscot on day 11 and visited the Opera House. This is absolutely magnificent place. Um, this was uh, a gift from uh, the Majesty Sultan Qaboos of the world. It is a, one of the most spectacular opera houses I've been in. I have been to many, 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 many around the world. Uh, the, 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 took many years to build this, and the, 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 the architectural design and the finish inside is nothing. Like, I don't think they spared any penny on anything in terms of the way they designed it and the way they built it, the architectural design. Uh, it, it was just breathtaking. Uh, I was sort of, you know, my guide, I was like, I went, can I touch it? It's like, yeah, yeah, you can touch it. It's like, and I would like touch the carving. It's like, oh my God, how did it? Yeah, so it took, uh, took a long time to build this. I believe it took about five years. Uh, and, uh, and this is the ceiling in the hallway. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, you know, have you been there, Ambassador? Yeah, it's an incredible place, incredible place. Uh, and, and, and right after that, I went to the National Museum. And uh, uh, the one thing that's really very interesting about, uh, about, uh, about Oman is the door. Doors are very important. You know, when you come to a home, the first thing you see is the door of the house that you're coming into. And that has to be sort of a welcoming door. And the way they designed the door and the way they architecturally put them together is just so important. Uh, and, and, and often in some of these homes, it was, it would be, 
very well decorated and it would be depicting uh, not necessarily just the wealth of the individual, but their, but their, you know, their hospitality, their welcoming you, you know. Now, I have to jump into uh, that evening uh, on the, on the, I stayed at the Al Bustan Hotel, which is a very nice hotel in, in Moscow. And this was a sunrise the next morning, sunrise photo, and these people were about to come in there and pick up their, their, their cab uh, catching uh, 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 nets. Uh, uh, now we're in day 12, uh, and now we're on our way to uh, uh, Fenja. Uh, this was an, a very interesting town. Now we're talking, now we're in the center part of, my, of, 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 of Oman, and then now we're going in that region around Muscat, going down to Sur, where, uh, and then going west to Nizwa. Uh, so to be able to do that, you have to come through certain, as, certain parts. Um, there is a, a small town called Fenja, uh, where we actually did a wonderful hike. Uh, small town, uh, sitting, nesting in the mountains. Um, this is a, a, an area called Berkat El Moz, or Berkat El Moz, where uh, actually bananas are produced in very, very large quantity in that part of the world. And then uh, this was a, a town that was abandoned, uh, that is being gradually rebuilt. People are buying these homes in that town and they're refinishing them. Yeah, Salamander. And this is the hotel I stayed at. It's in the mountains, it's called Jabal Al Akhdar. Uh, Jabal Al Akhdar, yes. And, uh, and it's a, a lovely place. Uh, I got up in the morning, the next morning, and when I run out there, it was just beautiful. Now, <coughs> now, on our way to Nizwa, uh, it, which is a place I wanted to go to because I knew how important Nizwa was. Uh, Nizwa is a town that's about 72,000 people. It used to be the old capital of Oman before Moscow took over. They had a big fight, but Moscow won. No. <laughs> but actually, Nizwa was a, uh, a, a beautiful town. Uh, what is, what Nizwa is really famous for is date. Uh, I, up until I uh, got to Oman, I did not realize that there is many, many different kinds of dates. You know, when you go to buy dates in the store, you would have one kind of dates. But when you get the Nizwa, you will walk into a date store and there would be 50 kinds of dates. And then this guy was, you know, letting me try each one of it. And then I said, by the time I try each one of this, I'm going to be full. Yeah. But there was one date that I absolutely loved, which is pink. It's almost like pink. It's like a small, uh, uh, you know, yellowish in color. Incredibly sweet and smooth and delicious. Uh, so I bought a bag, and by the time we actually got to Sir, I had finished the bag in my car. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, I went uh, to see the market uh, in Nizwa, and uh, uh, this happened to be on the day where people are trading their animals. They're selling them. They're auctioning their animals. It was absolutely a spectacular experience. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to be there. This was also during COVID. Uh, the, the head cover of the Omani people is very, really interesting. I've been to, like I said, 20 Arab countries around the world. Uh, this was one that I have not seen in any other Arab country. It's very unique for the Omani people. I did purchase one and I actually wore it. Uh, and I really intended to bring it with me, but I forgot. But it's, it's really, it keeps your head warm, in addition to being really attractive. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's, it's really a piece of art. Uh, and, and then I sat there and watched people bringing their animals and then auctioning them. And uh, uh, through an interpreter, I had a conversation with this little kid who was auctioning his goat little baby goat 
And uh, it was really funny because I, I think in one of the photos you'll see him. He's right over there, this little kid here. And he was like almost like upset that someone's gonna take his goat. But at the same time, he knew it was like really, it was part of, part of life. I mean, it was something that he has to let go of, you know. And in a way, like he was so like, oh, you're taking it away from me. I, I just love that, that vision of him. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it speaks a lot for, 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 for what these kids go through, but at the same time, it's a way of life that they live in. And then this kid really was pretty happy about his, and he was petting it. Uh, and this was actually in the market after that uh, in, in Nizwa. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, nuts are big over there. But then there's this really very special dessert, and I don't know how many of you have tried that. What is it called? Halwa, halwa. And you know, I've, I've had halwa in many parts of the world, but I've never had this halwa. It, 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 it could have all kind of different flavors. Uh, the ones that I kind of like the most are the one that have uh, more of a, um, uh, I think they have figs, the, the, uh, uh, yeah, figs. They have the figs, uh, you know, they have some figs in them. I, I kind of like that one the most. I brought a couple at home. Incredibly sweet, loaded with sugar but uh, a very tasty. It was a great cup of, well, the cup of coffee. It's a wonderful thing to have. Uh, this little kid really wanted me to buy one of his, uh, uh, you know, and I said, you know what, I can't because I can't carry it on the plane. He said, well, you can carry it on your back. You have a place in your backpack. It's like, no, I can't carry it. <laughs> take it on my backpack, you know. But he was a lovely kid, and he said, can you take a picture of me next to it? And we did, and, and it was so funny. He actually ended up taking my hat, too. Um, <laughs> I gave it to him. Uh, so uh, this was, you uh, know, oh nuts, uh, cardamom. Everybody loves cardamom here. You use it in your cooking. God, I love cardamom. I do my cooking all the all the time, and I have a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends say, "What, what, do you, what is in the chicken? What is in this? This? What is in this meal? Oh, it's cardamom. What is that?" Anyway, it's a wonderful thing, and I brought quite a bit. Actually, I brought a lot of a lot of spices from my Oman, and I I, I'm, I still use them. In Nizwa, there's a Nizwa castle, spectacular castle, renovated, and uh, uh, of course uh, the locals put on a nice display for all the tourists. Live bullets. <laughs> it was a lot of fun watching them sing. And now we're on our way to Jebel Hashem, and um, and this is a uh, this is an area that was uh, absolutely spectacular. Uh, this is would be the equivalent of uh, what would you say in the United States, the Grand Canyon. This would be the Grand Canyon of of you know U.S. And it it was so windy when we got over there, and I. Uh, I, 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 so many people were out there, and and I really wanted to get to the edge, but I was very nervous. Uh, but you can see, I got as close as I could. Uh, but it was uh, absolutely amazing. But of course, my, my guide decided to to be more adventurous than I am, and, uh, and so he was actually standing pretty much on the edge of this. And you look down. This is what you're looking down at. Yikes, that's what it was, yeah. <laughs> you know, and we did a, an amazing hike that day. And I want to tell you something about this hike. Uh, 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 we on that hike came across an American family with their two children. And, and, and we were just standing on the way. And this, is, this marker is actually a marker that's used for, for trails in, in, in Oman. How much time do I have? Another 10 minutes? I have to tell the story because, you know, I, I, I know we're coming to the close of the end, but this story tells you more about the Omani people, more than anything else I can share, share you with. Uh, when we got to the town, and I'll show you the, the, the hotel that I stayed at, which is an old remodeled, remodeled town. This, this, by the way, this town that we're going to here now is called the Misfat Ebrin. Um, or actually the actual town called Hessen al-Misfa. 
Now, the place I stayed in was a remodeled old home, but when, we, when I got there, I decided to go out for a hike, and while I was hiked, I came across this man, women, two children. So, how was your trip? Oh, it's great, you know, oh. So I said, well, you can't believe what happened to us. So what happened to you? So, well, you know, we were coming in, and keep in mind, these are mountainous regions, and you're driving in the four-wheel drive, there's a lot of potholes in the road and rough roads, and they had a flat tire. So this guy got out of the car and uh, wanted to do the flat tire. And then Omani comes in in his four-wheel drive and he looks at them and he, and he comes out and he says, well, can I help you with anything? Well, you know, we had a flat tire. So, well, uh, he looked around, came in there. The flat tire that they had, the, the replacement for the flat tire that they have didn't look very good to him. It looked like it was worn. And he was worried that if they actually or to put the flat tire on, they wouldn't be able to get to, 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 uh, you know, to the town where we're staying, which is uh, Hassan al Misfa. Hassan al Misfa. So he said, "Well, you know what? Here's my car keys. Take my car, and then go to the hotel. I know where you are. I'll wait for my friend uh, to come here. Uh, I'm sorry. I will. I will uh, replace your tire." I will take it to a place and I would have the tire replaced and I'll bring it back to you. So this Omani gentleman with his friend, one took the car and replaced the tire, took it to a place, put a brand new tire while they took his car and drove to the hotel. And that evening they brought that car back to this to the to the to the couple and their children. The reason why they did that because they saw a couple of kids in the car, they were afraid that you know something might happen, it was getting late in the afternoon. But this is the kind of people that you come across. People that are willing to go above and beyond to help a tourist, to help someone. Here's my car, take it, I'll take care of your car, I'll bring it to you in the evening. And that's, you know, to, to, to me that speaks, you know, for me that, that I've said this story to many people since I got back here, uh, just to let them know that this is the type of people that, that the Omani people are. So thank you for being who you are. Uh, this is the hotel I stayed at. I mean, my room was right up on top over there. Uh, and I actually, it was on the other side. I think my room was like right out here. And. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I may have a, a place where, okay, actually there's another picture. This is the, the town, and uh, you know, this is a picture from the hotel up on top. This is how I got up to my room, uh, right there. Uh, and and this, is, this is on our way back from that town and, uh, that evening, and you have a beautiful sunset over uh, uh, Jabal Shams. Day 14. Uh, now we're uh, going to uh, really an amazing area called uh, 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 th this is the uh, Wahiba Sands Desert. On our way over there, uh, Wahiba Wahiba Sand the Wahibas are a tribe in in Oman. Uh, we came across this uh, this incredible tombs. No one knows exactly how old they are, but they're probably thousands of years old. And these are tombs. Uh, a lot of people they call them beehive beehive tombs, and then came across, uh, of course, uh, camels because now we are in in a, in a different desert of Oman, which is now more in the north central part of the state, west of Muscat. And uh, my Omani guide uh, was saying we'll try and have a conversation with the with the camel, and again, spectacular sand dunes. I can't even tell you how beautiful it was. You know, we sat and watched sunset over there. Uh, and this is the village that we stayed in, in Wadi Bani Khaled. Wadi Bani Khaled. Bani Khaled are the, are the tribe, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, I mean, this really doesn't serve, if you, you have to be there to smell the air and, and feel the temperature and, you know, just incredible. Uh, they tented, they, they pitched a pent tent for us, so we, you know, spent some time over there, and actually I slept in one of these tents, but it was fancier uh, than that, and then that particular uh, place where I stayed in had some uh, other uh, animals that were actually wild animals that are often seen 
in in uh, in the desert. You don't want to mess with this guy. Nice little kid. And I love this photo, the camel sitting out there. And, uh, and like I said, take a look at those lips, you know? And then I love the way the sand is created, you know, in, in there. And now we're in, uh, uh, we visited, but you know, we visited an area which, uh, which is where the Dow boat factories are. Um, all of it is handmade, old doors. Uh, and now we're in Sur. Uh, Sur is the village that I told you that has the uh, green turtles. And then we did go and see the green turtles that night. Uh, green turtles are the largest green turtles in the world. Uh, they are they're about a meter wide. And then they actually come out at night, they lay their eggs, and then they go back to the sea. And then these particular turtles, are some of them are marked, and they basically go away, and their babies are born, and they leave, and they come back to the same place. And it's incredible how they're able to do that. We stayed in there overnight, and the next morning we went there, and you can see this uh, one uh, uh, turtle uh, coming in to lay her eggs. And then the next morning, uh, here she's out there on the beach, and uh, you can see her tracks over there. She's already left and made it back to the ocean. Um, one thing that's really interesting about this is you can see the seagulls in the back here. What they're doing, they're lining up the beach, waiting for the babies that are hatched to come down so they can eat them. Uh, out, of, out of every 1,000 of these eggs that are laid that are hatched, only one of them survives. The rest are actually eaten by the, uh, eaten by the birds or, you know, um, or don't survive. And they, we know once they made it to the water, they get eaten by other animals. So at the end of the day, the number of survival is one per thousand. Uh, and then you can see here, for example, I have to show you this image because this is the turtle uh, coming back to the ocean. And then the birds assume that that's where the babies are going to go back to. So they basically come around it. Uh, you know, preparing themselves for the next meal the next morning. Uh, and now, now we're in, uh, 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 after that, we're uh, visiting an area called Wadi Shab, uh, which is uh, another spectacular area where uh, I was supposed to, to actually uh, swim, uh, but I had a panic attack. Uh, because I was afraid because we were in a cave and I, I, and I, I still have panic disorder uh, so I said okay I'm not going to do this but it was a, a lovely experience absolutely a lovely experience there are caves with uh, beautiful blue water in there um, Donkeys, and it is actually this is actually a uh, uh, a sinkhole. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a sinkhole. I have never seen it. This was the first sinkhole I've seen. Uh, the geology behind it is really interesting because I think it's an area where the crust of the earth has to break, and then water level level table has to go up, and then it creates that. And there were people swimming in it, and there was this gentleman who decided to jump in it. You know, you see him jumping down there. He jumping in the sinkhole. Uh, and then lastly, I have to show you this. Uh, this was a beautiful sunrise photo the next day when the day I actually left Oman. Uh, and then I saw people walking on the beach. Um, this is my hotel. And, and then I have to show you these few stories about my hike. This is the last hike that I did that, I, uh, that my guy told me that you nearly killed me. And, uh, and, and take a look at how hard it was. I mean, we were really climbing the size of the wall like this and it was it was quite a bit of fun uh, if you have it's, it's actually around uh, Muscat it, it's called the Riam Park are you familiar with that uh, around Muscat so we did that and it was quite a bit of fun uh, and day 18 is uh, visited a museum uh, 
uh, New Art Museum, uh, Oman is, uh, you know, uh, every region have their own clothing design. I think you have some, some photograph downstairs of that. Uh, nature is the most beautiful creator of art. And uh, this was actually my last day with my, with my guide. And, uh, uh, and um, he was uh, is someone who I actually still communicate with. And we, we have a wonderful relationship. In fact, he keep asking me, uh, when are you gonna come back to Oman? And I said, I hope soon. Well, I have two seconds here just to let you know that I'm a birder. I love birds. I watch birds all over the world. Uh, I watch many, many species. And I have to show you these quick photos of many, many birds that I saw in Oman that I, I think they were just amazing. Um, Oman's bird life is nothing like ever experienced before. You don't have to go very far other than just pick up your binocular and be in the backyard and you will find a beautiful bird like this guy. Like this guy actually was just like standing right there in front of me. Uh, Many of their bird species are actually uh, present in our, but many of them are not. Some of them are migratory. Uh, I, can, I don't want to bore you with all the names, but I just want you to enjoy the beauty of these creatures. Um, they are well respected and loved in that part of the world, which I truly admire. Uh, and birds mean a lot to me, and they mean a lot to the universe. And, uh, but all of these is right there in that beautiful country of Oman. This was a journey that I would love for you to consider and share and enjoy. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, for me, it was a dream of a lifetime since I was 14, I wanted to go there, I made it. And uh, thank you for your time. I was a little girl hearing about Oman and I was fantasizing about it. But uh, like the public here in America, uh, probably they are not hearing enough. This is a great a country and the scenery and the experience looks beautiful. Why Americans, I don't hear uh, that they are Yes. What does it take on the part of the probably Ministry of, uh, of Tourism to do a, a, an ad on uh, CNN or uh, like, uh, I don't know what it takes to make Oman's name on, on people's, uh, in people's memory? And, and it, I, I shouldn't, I should say though, that the tourism of Oman as a country, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a significant, uh, is a significant source of uh, the GDP for that country. Uh, Oman's tourism industry is growing. And during the time I was there, it was right after COVID, it was still actually in the middle of COVID in 2020, the Omicron was still there. And I came across a lot of people from different parts of the world. Not many Americans. Uh, I think they, I mean, Omani, Oman needs to do a better job at marketing themselves as a country that has enormous amount of uh, uh, opportunities. But I can't speak for the Omani government. They need to do a better job. I know I had a conversation with the mayor of Muscat, uh, and uh, I think that's something that they really want to do and I think they're working very hard at. But definitely, I think it's a country that's well worth visiting. And I, I you know, and honestly, it was, not, it was an article in, 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 in a Travel Magazine about, by this woman that I read a few years ago about her experience there that actually got me interested, plus all the other things. That, you know. Anything else you want to say? Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Very interesting presentation. I'm curious what um, stood out to you most about your experience photographing in Oman compared to the other Arabian countries that you visited? That's a very good question. Uh, 
You know, uh, I have to think a little bit about this, the diversity. Uh, the ocean, the mountains, the, uh, the, um, the valleys, uh, the, 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 the diversity of, of the opportunities I had to photograph. To be on the ocean one day and then the mountains the same day and then the valley in the third day and on the desert on the fourth day and to really be consistently interacting with the natives. You know, in many countries around the world where I travel, you know, suddenly you have, you have the people of the country and you have everybody else who has decided to modernize themselves and dress differently and look differently. The thing about Oman, everybody dresses the same. I mean, when you go into the, to, to the souk, you know, in many European countries, you see uh, the, this movement toward really modernizing their look, modernizing the way they are dressed. But the Imani men still dress the same way everywhere I go. I mean, except unless actually I met some, I had some business uh, conversation with several where actually people were dressed in a suit. But for the majority of the time, they really were dressing in their normal, and even kids in school. I was absolutely fascinated by looking at the kids going to school and they all wearing their, their, their traditional dress with their head cover. You know, these are kids in middle school, you know. And I, I found that to be really inspiring and beautiful. Uh, like, I didn't even see that in Africa. I mean, in Africa, you see it's only shorts and T-shirts and stuff like that. And uh, same thing in Morocco and same thing in Algeria or Tunisia or, you know, Egypt, of course. You know, you have a totally different. Uh, it's also something else for me. It was not crowded. It was not congested. I mean, Oman was a busy, I mean, Moscow is a busy city, but nowhere near. Like, if you've been to Cairo, my God. I mean, one street in Cairo has as many people living as in Moscow. So it was not as crowded. It was more open, you know. You know. So it's, I think that's, that's what made it different. And birds, 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 and more birds. I didn't go very far to see all these beautiful creatures around me. You know, and even my guide, my guide actually started getting into birds, and he went and bought a bird book, <laughs> and he started marking all the birds that he was seeing. So, what is this bird, and what is this bird? So, yeah, I'm sorry. Incidentally, we have a book, a great book in our library, on the birds of Oman. So oh, that's awesome. Anyone can check it out. And actually, it's written by an American and his wife. Yes. And, and yes. Man, yeah, I know. I, I I actually know of him. I don't, I've not met them, but I know of them. Uh, yes? I am working on the... You know, uh, I, I just... I'm just going in the process of hiring an editor, and and uh, we've had some conversations. And I think what we're looking at doing right now is doing a a coffee table book of photography that compiles many photographs that I have in many parts of the country. Uh, in 2011, I won I won the the natural photographers the nation's national photographer award, which is a uh, I forgot what they called it. And then the year before that, I won a the, the Amateur National Geographic Photography Award. And then in the last several years, I've won a lot of small little awards here and there, and I have some work. You know, so what we're trying to do is take all the photos that we really had succeeded in, you know, and then trying to build on them and trying to, and also incorporate with them the stories. Like the stories about me and the Arab Sea Arabian Sea is to me like I can't see the Arabian Sea without thinking about my childhood and my memories of reading Sinbad books and you know Frankenstein and all that. Photography is a journey. I mean, I think I think the thing about photography that I always feel it's so it, it, it's so easy to take pictures and you can have many many of them. But if the pictures don't tell a story, they really are lacking 
the essential essence of what they really are for. So I think if what you're trying to do is to share a story through that picture and use that picture as a way to convey the message that you want or the emotions that you have, the best thing. In 2014, 2015, I led a program in the city of Milwaukee called Photography is Life. And what it was is bringing inner city kids, giving them cameras, and taking them out and having them take pictures. And then suddenly, when they start taking pictures of their neighborhoods, of the birds around, they develop more compassion and more love for the neighborhood that they're in. So they stop throwing garbage in there. Because now suddenly they have images of their village and their beauty that it can be. So, so I think that photography can help us be more friendly to nature and also more friendly to each other. Because we're all the same. You know, I, I, in, I had three guys. Hamoud was my favorite because Hamoud was, was very, very inquisitive and very well read. The other two were really weren't. And Hamoud and I developed a wonderful relationship because, because when I shared with him like my stories, he's like immediately connected with them. And he would say, okay, let's go to that place because I think that you will see something there that might be important for you. Like the Frankenstein trees, when I told him I wanted to see them, he said, most tourists, you know, they just want to, you know, see one in their car and walk away. I said, no, 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 I want to touch them. I want to smell them. I want to I wanna spend time with those trees. I just don't want to be walking in and out of there. So he said, how much time do we have? I said, well, I don't want, like, five minutes. I want, like, two hours. Can we spend two hours here? He said, okay, you know, okay, we can do that. So I think that... Yes, some of them really connected with me. Uh, when I was at the hotel, in, in many of the hotels that I've stayed in, and I've stayed at many of them during the time I was there, uh, everybody that I would come across, I would have my computer and I would share with them like the stories, the pictures that I've just, and there's people who like literally live in the neighborhood that haven't seen them. <laughs> they haven't even been back to see the their, own, their own streets, their own backyard. And that's the same thing that we have here. Like in our country, you know, no one go to the Yellowstone, you know, but we, we have beauty in our country. And when I show some of the bird pictures for some of the people at the hotel, oh my God, oh, that beautiful, that's a beautiful bird. I was like, it's right over there <laughs> on that tree behind your door. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I think, I think the world is, is so beautiful. You know, there are so many bad things. We hear so many powerful things. But I tell you one thing, with my travel and with my journey around the world, I have never, never, ever had any problems. Never. I've never, ever been, I've always felt, you know, there are so many good people in the world, and photography actually brings us together, uh, makes us appreciate what we have, and makes us appreciate the world around us. And unfortunately, there's still reason not to celebrate it, but I think we need to take the other approach. That's the best note to end on. Thank so you. thank you, Dr. Adel, again. Thank you.